Hello and welcome to Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis, our weekly open forum webinar series for pharmacists. I'm Michael Hogue, the president of the American Pharmacists Association and dean and professor at Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy. We're so glad that you've joined us this week. We're very excited that this week we're offering continuing education for our weekly webinar. We do CE once a month, and uh, we know that that brings a lot of uh, attention, and uh, we have a lot of folks uh, joining us this week, so uh, welcome. Uh, if you're listening to this broadcast uh, asynchronously after the fact, we're sorry, but the CE is only available for those individuals who joined us live uh, for this particular program. Now, today's topic is the myths and the facts associated with the pathophysiology, transmission treatment, and the vaccines of COVID-19. There are a lot of uh, uh, things that circulate through the news media and uh, online, and it's sometimes a little hard to tell what is really scientifically true and what is uh, really not. And so we're gonna really parse that out today. And to do that with us is our uh, very own Dr. Dan Zlot. He is our resident expert at APHA and all things COVID. As many of you know, Dr. Zlot spent 10 years on the staff at the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute and in NCI doing work in oncology and immunology. He has a tremendous understanding of the inner workings of the virus and has kept up very uh, detailed. In fact, many of you know Dan is the star uh, for uh, APHA's 15 on 19 series, our 15 minute uh, CE programs that we offer. And there's dozens of those available uh, on pharmacist.com that give you snippets of uh, factual information for 15 minutes of continuing education. So would encourage you to take a look at those if you haven't done that already. So we're gonna be happy to have Dan with us. We're also gonna take your questions throughout today's webinar. Uh, we have some information we'll share, of course, uh, to ensure that we meet compliance with all of ACPE's uh, rules related to providing CE, but we're gonna take your questions and answers on any topic that you might wanna ask questions about related to COVID-19 and helping Dan answer those questions will be APHA Government Affairs uh, lead staff, Elisa Bernstein, who's Senior Vice President for Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs. And as all of you uh, who have been with us for many weeks know, Elisa came to APHA staff after a 30-year career with the FDA. So she has a really great understanding of how the regulatory environment operates and uh, what's going on in Congress. And Elisa will share with us uh, toward the end of today's webinar, some late breaking news uh, related to things going on at FDA in one case and in other cases, other um, regulatory uh, and congressional things that are happening in Capitol Hill. We're also going to be joined by Mitch Rothholz. Mitch uh, is a longtime expert in immunizations and vaccine practice. He's the chief of governance and state affiliates for APHA. But many of you know that for uh, the better part of 25 years, uh, Mitch has been highly engaged on the national level with vaccines. And so when we have questions about COVID-19 vaccines and those things come up during our discussion today, uh, Mitch will be our subject matter expert to talk about uh, those particular plans. So we're excited about that as well. Now, I want to just uh, cover a few other uh, things beyond the introduction of our speakers before we have them. We need to declare to you that the APHA staff nor I have any conflicts of interest or financial interest in any product or service that's being mentioned today. Uh, so uh, no conflicts of interest as it relates to our continuing education. Today's CE is being offered for both pharmacists and technicians, and it's a knowledge-based CE. Uh, you did need to register, and of course, all of you have done that because you're connected to today's webinar. And when we get finished today, I will share the CE uh, information with you, and including the code at the very end of today's webinar. Uh, so uh, you'll have to go on and claim your credit at pharmacist.com when we get to that point. 
We have uh, three key learning objectives today that we're going to cover during our uh, myths versus facts discussion. Uh, of course, talking about the myths uh, versus facts and um, uh, and uh, discussing the latest uh, information about COVID-19. And then we always want to cover with you the latest in reference resources. Um, so that's uh, another important thing for us to do is to make sure we can find credible information, not just uh, give you the facts today, but show you where you can get the credible information you need to be able to advise your patients and make good decisions. So very important. Now we have a, a process that we follow for our Q&A. As I mentioned to you earlier, we do take your questions throughout the webinar. And if you look at the GoToWebinar uh, control panel, you will note that there is a questions box, a questions tab. If you click on that tab, you can then type in your questions uh, and we would encourage you to do that even right now. Uh, before we even get into the meat of the program, please, if you have a question that's burning in your mind about COVID-19, maybe you have heard something, a myth that you're not just completely sure if it's a myth or a fact and you'd like to find out about it, go ahead and type it in so that we can work it into the program today on the fly and, and make sure that you get answers to your questions. We're going to take as many questions from our audience today as possible and, uh, and, and try to make sure that you have what you need uh, to be effective in the work that you're doing day in and day out. We do ask that, um, uh, that you please be willing to uh, let, us at, let, let you ask your question verbally. Now, how do we do that? Well, everyone's lines muted currently, but if you're connected via your computer, you can click on uh, the little microphone icon at the top left and it will turn either orange or green. And if it's orange, it means your microphone's off. If it's green, it means your microphone's on. Uh, when we call your name, you want to have your microphone green so that it's on. The staff will unmute your line and then we'll give you up to the one minute to be able to ask your question verbally. If for some reason you do not have audio capability, that's no problem. Just type into your question, no audio available, uh, and I'll ask your question for you. So it's okay uh, for uh, you to do it in that way as well. We'll be able to take uh, handle the questions either way. For those of you who are joining us via a landline or a uh, cell phone, I just wanna remind you, you do need to enter your audio PIN number into your telephone in order to activate the audio capabilities on your phone. So that's very important as well. So let's make sure that we do that. Uh, again, we wanna answer as many questions as we can possibly answer. Um, and so uh, that's the ground rules that we'll use for today. The handout for today's uh, webinar is available in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, all of the links in our handouts are active, which means you can go directly to uh, the link that we've provided and get the resources quickly uh, because we know you're busy in practice and don't need to go hunting for these things. We try to make it easy for you so that you can get what you need as quickly as possible. So that's available for you as well. So with that, uh, let's uh, ask Dan's lot to join us on camera. Uh, Dan, um, I am excited to get to talk with you about the myths and the facts. It seems like we've had an awful lot of uh, myth building that's happened during the COVID pandemic. Would you agree? Absolutely. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, regardless of where you get your sources of information, there's a little bit of truth interspersed with an awful lot of myth, it seems like, no matter what we do. So let's just jump right into it and let, let's, uh, let's throw the first question out there for our audience. And audience, you'll be able to just click on your screen and give us your response to this question. Is this true or false? Our NSAIDs are unsafe to use in the setting of COVID-19. This is something we've heard in the media a great deal. NSAIDs are unsafe to use in the setting of COVID-19. Is that true or is that false? Let's uh, take a look at this one. So we're getting our responses in. Everybody just click, um, click on your response. Great, thanks everybody for being quick on the polling here. Let's go ahead and show the results. And uh, 
It looks. Oh, we're not. Oh, we're not going to cover the results. That right. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm used to getting the results right away. We're going to give Dan a chance to tell us what the facts are about NSAIDs and COVID-19. So, Dan, uh, share us a little factual information. Absolutely. So, this was probably one of the earliest controversies that we came across in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll run through the timeline, and we've got some more information with the details a little bit later on, but. Early on, things were very confusing. Um, there was a paper in Lancet that described a theoretical mechanism by which NSAIDs may increase the risk of either uh, infection, morbidity, or mortality from COVID-19. And the, the way that works essentially is that, uh, as many of you know, uh, COVID-19 infects cells by uh, binding to the ACE2 inhibitor on the cell surface, I'm sorry, the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface, and then gaining entry into the cell. Uh, by taking NSAIDs, the thought was that uh, there's some evidence that NSAIDs upregulate the expression of uh, the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface, thereby making it more uh, easy, e making it more uh, more targets available for the virus to join uh, to the cells and actually gain entry. So that's the theoretical um, basis for that. And so, kind of based on that, we started seeing. Uh, some pretty prominent groups, including individuals, governments, and even the World Health Organization, um, jump out there and say that NSAIDs were not safe to use in COVID-19 disease. Uh, later on, some of those groups course corrected, um, and then finally the FDA jumped in with the actual statement. And uh, because of that initial confusion, uh, the back and forth that NSAIDs were not safe, and then there was no evidence that they caused harm, people still are confused about NSAIDs. And that's actually one of the questions that we get um, fairly frequently here at APHA from both pharmacists and occasionally from a patient or two who uh, comes to us for information. So next slide, Brian. So this is just the, that, that paper. So if you wanna actually read the paper, um, here's the paper that discusses the mechanistic um, role for um, the upregulation of ACE2 by NSAIDs. Next slide, Brian. And uh, so I, I really never thought I'd be uh, citing Twitter in, in uh, you know, academic-like uh, presentations, but that's, that's where we're at these days. So the French Minister of Health uh, tweets out, this is all taking place back in March, taking anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen or cortisone could be an aggravating factor for infection. If you have a fever, take paracetamol, which is the equivalent of Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, so very prominent and a lot of people listen to that. Uh, next slide, please. And so then the World Health Organization jumped on board and issued a warning against you, the use of ibuprofen in COVID-19 patients. And then the next day they changed their mind. And that's the actual screenshot of their, their tweet. Uh, and what they say is that uh, WHO does not recommend against the use of ibuprofen. And of course, Twitter being Twitter, um, <laughs> everybody blew up at the, the use of a double negative to try to clarify a message saying that there's no evidence that NSAIDs cause harm. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, on March 19th, the FDA weighed in and made a, a very clear statement that there's no evidence of scientific, uh, no scientific evidence whatsoever that suggests that NSAIDs like ibuprofen uh, increase the risk of uh, COVID-19. And I did a literature search actually just a couple minutes before we started this uh, webinar just to make sure that nothing had changed and that is still accurate. There's still no scientific evidence that NSAIDs uh, increase the risk or severity of COVID-19. Well, I tell you, Dan, this is uh, this is really interesting because I, you know, I'm not the most social media t savvy person. I'm pretty active on Facebook for people who know me, but I'm not on a lot of things. But I did notice that early on in the pandemic, there were a lot of uh, friends of mine who are pharmacists and some who are physicians who were uh, retweeting or reposting uh, comments like those from the French minister and patients assume that because it's coming out of a pharmacist, it must be factual. Do you have any words of advice to pharmacists about social media posting of clinical information that you'd like to give? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, it's, it's a great question, Michael, because there's so much good information, but also bad information floating around out there in social media. And so because of the nature of social media and the 
inability to verify the information that you're seeing come across on social media. Um, I would not use social media as my primary source of information. And anything that comes across social media when we get questions about it, we dig into it. Obviously, we're looking at the primary literature. That's the best source of legitimate information to really help answer your questions. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, and just remember that our patients are in fact paying attention to what we're saying. So very, very important to validate and get as much scientific basis to your postings before you make them. That's very, very important. Well, Dan, we've got lots of subjects to talk about and I can tell you the question box is already filling up. So let's move on to the next one. I'm gonna put another question for our audience to respond to up on the screen. There is significant human experience with the mRNA and adenovirus vaccine platforms used for some of the COVID-19 vaccines currently in phase three trials. Is it true or false? There is pre significant human experience with mRNA and adenovirus platforms used for some COVID-19 vaccines in phase three trials. So we hear a lot about this on the news. Some people say, we don't know anything about these vaccines. They've never been tested. We don't know anything about them. There's no way that we could get a vaccine. And some people say, well, yeah, we do know something about it. So we're going to get to the facts of this. And I'm curious to know what you all think about this. So let's go ahead and uh, close the poll. We got uh, a good, good number of you. Almost all of you have responded to this question. And so, um, so Dan, tell us about this. Uh, do, have we ever seen these uh, va vaccine uh, vectors that were, or platforms that are being used? Have they ever been tried before or used anywhere else? Yeah, it's a great question. And the reason we thought this was so important, as you alluded to, Michael, there are so many surveys out there suggesting that patients are hesitant to receive these vaccines because they view the technology as being new, um, or maybe they view the process that uh, the FDA is going to use to approve them uh, as being rushed. And so we'll talk about both of those things. It turns out that both the mRNA and the adenovirus platforms have been used in humans for more than 15 years. Um, when I was back at NIH, I started at NIH in uh, 2008. And when I joined, we were already investigating. We were using both adenovirus vector technology as well as mRNA uh, vaccine technology to try to immunize patients against cancer in an attempt to boost the immune response against cancer and try to use the immune system essentially to treat cancer or to augment uh, the response to traditional chemotherapy. And so in addition to the work in cancer, um, people have been using adenovirus-based vectors for gene therapy in humans for more than 15 years. Some of the early literature started in the, in the late 90s even. Um, and so there is actually a significant amount of human experience with both the adenovirus platform and mRNA-based technologies. And they're extremely well tolerated when you look at the literature. Um, there's very, very few adverse events. Most of the adverse events that you see um, occur in patients who uh, received what are called adjuvanted vaccines, where they're really trying to boost the immune response by adding in some additional things that sort of, I like to call it, you know, poke, poke the hornet's nest of the immune system uh, locally around the injection site to try to get a more potent immune response. And adjuvants are something we see pretty frequently in, in a lot of the newer vaccines that are coming out. Shingrix is a great example of that. So uh, that's, that's the answer. We have tremendous amounts of experience with this and by and large, um, very, very well tolerated. So while we're on this subject of vaccines, Elisa Bernstein, if you could join us on camera, Quickly, I'm going to go ahead and interject a question for you that's more regulatory related. Uh, I've heard that the FDA is going to have a committee meeting to talk about uh, vaccines that uh, for COVID-19 that might be coming to market. Is that true? And can you tell us when that meeting is scheduled for and what, what pharmacists can look for in that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, FDA. Uh, as, as with many approvals, FDA holds advisory committee meetings, and the advisory committees are made up of experts around the country on the issues at hand. Here, the FDA has a vaccine and related biological products advisory committee. And this is a committee that's gonna be listening. They're holding a meeting October 22nd, um, and they're gonna be looking at data and information um, to review you know, prior to any issuance of any 
EUA or emergency use authorization or approval of a COVID-19 vaccine. So the, the meeting on October 22nd, because it is so, so highly, um, uh, a lot of people are anticipating it, um, we believe and we've been told that it will be open to the general public. Um, and this is where they're going to look at the, you know, the data that's available as of now. So, and I just would tell our listeners, for those of you who are APHA members, APHA has a member engage platform. And on the engage platform, we have a COVID-19 discussion section. And uh, we also have an immunizing pharmacist special interest group section. And the details for how you can access that uh, v, uh, uh, Verbach meeting for FDA on October 22nd, the link to be able to connect to that and listen is on the Engage platform. So if you're not connected already, let me encourage you to do so. And uh, so thank you very much, Elisa, for that. Let's move on to question three, clinical question three, Dan. Um, uh, I got to say that probably nothing has created more controversy in healthcare than the old drug hydroxychloroquine. So let's ask our audience, there is strong evidence which suggests that hydroxychloroquine is effective for COVID-19 prophylaxis. What do you think? Is COVID uh, hydroxychloroquine used for prophylaxis? Is there strong evidence to support this? Well, you're responding. We're getting our responses up there. Give it just a couple more seconds to give everybody a chance to vote. Wow, we got lots of interest in this question. Nearly 100% of you voted, so we will take that. Dan, tell us about hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis. What does the science say about this? So again, another, another great question with lots and lots of um, information out there, some of it more accurate than others on both sides of this issue. And this is something that actually, like many of the uh, things we're going to talk about, has actually shifted a little bit over the course of COVID-19 in terms of our early understanding and now our more current understanding. So early case reports and non-randomized trials suggested that hydroxychloroquine might actually be a useful prophylactic agent in patients with a history of COVID-19 exposure. And so when you look at those, again, the key things to, to hone in on there are the fact that these are case reports and non-randomized trials. So essentially we have no control group. Uh, it's very difficult to draw solid conclusions other than to say there may be something there and it's worth studying further. And so uh, then later on, we do see some much better qu uh, quality trials and sort of the gold standard, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was performed. And that demonstrated that hydroxychloroquine was not efficacious for COVID-19 prophylaxis. Uh, a very nicely designed study, very well-designed study, um, was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so, uh, again, um, a great place to go for information there. I found the New England Journal of Medicine, they've got a COVID-19 resource center um, where they've kind of put gathered all of their COVID-19 literature in one spot to make it a little easier to access. Uh, I hit that almost every day just to see if there's any new updates. So a great resource for pharmacists if you're looking for sources of reliable information. And just to note as well, some of those early reports, you'll note it in the literature there, some of them are still not peer reviewed and it's been you know seven or eight months at this point since they were initially put up on uh, Med MedRxIV. And so, um, We've been relying on MedRxIV a lot because it's a good source of information while things are going through the publication process, but you really need to keep in mind that things that go up there are not peer-reviewed and may not ever get to the point of uh, being peer-reviewed or being submitted. So some of those things don't always pan out. So you'd have to take them with a pretty decent-sized grain of salt as you're reviewing that literature. So bottom line, Dan, if I'm hearing you correctly, is there is not enough scientific evidence to tell us that hydroxychloroquine is effective for prophylaxis. And uh, so that's, a, I think, our important takeaway. And again, I want to just remind our audience, all of the links and the slides that you see are active. You can go directly to these uh, reference resources that Dan's provided. And Dan, we appreciate you providing those for our audience so that folks can go read for themselves uh, what the literature has to say. Well, I want to take another more, uh, probably more recent uh, and in-depth clinical question that's come along. Um, <clears throat> this is our true and false question we'll ask our audience to respond to. 
there is strong evidence that the moderate to severe symptoms of COVID-19 are from bradykinin storm versus cytokine release system, a syndrome. There's strong evidence that moderate to severe symptoms of COVID-19 are from bradykinin storm versus cytokine release syndrome. So this is a very uh, important clinical question because those patients who wind up being in the ICU and perhaps even on ventilators, we need to understand what is going on in their system that re that's really causing them to find themselves in such a really bad situation. So we've gotten good response on this question, so we'll close the poll. And Dan, tell us about bradykinin storm and cytokine release syndrome. So again, again this is a, another really interesting topic and one where our understanding is still evolving. So first off, where does this theory come from about uh, bradykinin storm? It's something we really haven't heard about until really about middle August is kind of when this bloomed and has really surfaced. So interestingly enough, um, now that we've got all these great computational uh, resources at our disposal, people started putting a lot of data into these supercomputers to try to identify um, gene expression patterns, clinical patterns, cytokine levels, anything they could think of that would uh, indicate causes uh, that needed to be explored. And so uh, the group at the Oak Ridge National Lab used their supercomputer. It's called Summit, the Summit supercomputer. And they analyzed 17,000 different genetic samples from uh, patients with COVID-19 disease. And out of that analysis, uh, basically the supercomputer spat out, hey, there is a pretty significant genetic signal that bradykinin is, and the bradykinin pathway uh, is being upregulated. And so um, bradykinin, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, bradykinin is a very potent pro-inflammatory cytokine. And so uh, one of the things that we are, what we've seen uh, with COVID-19 is that a lot of the more moderate to severe symptoms are caused by the immune response to the virus. Not so much the virus itself, but it's our immune system's reaction and the um, release of massive re amounts of cytokines, potentially bradykinin as well, and the vasodilation that, that, that occurs as a result of that and all the leaky blood vessels, you get fluid uh, extravasating going from inside the blood vessels into the surrounding tissue, causing edema in the lungs, which makes it difficult to ventilate patients for them to actually get oxygen. Um, and so traditionally, when you see that, we think of something called cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome. And that's what everybody has been thinking is at the root cause of um, a lot of the more moderate to severe symptoms in COVID-19. So along comes a supercomputer and says, hey, dummies, you've got it all wrong. It has very little to do with cytokine release syndrome. It's actually bradykinin. So that's kind of where this initially started. And so then from there, uh, a group in, I believe it was in Australia, take a look, took a look at um, bronco, bronchoalveolar lavage or BAL samples from COVID-19 patients. Uh, and they found high levels of bradykinin precursors, not bradykinin itself, because bradykinin is very transient and gets metabolized very quickly. And they also found low levels of the enzymes that degrade bradykinin as compared to control patients. And so what we know about bradykinin, I mentioned it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And what that means is it does a lot of those same things I was just talking about. It induces vasodilation, uh, which results in hypotension, uh, which are certainly clinical effects we see in COVID-19 patients. Additionally, um, as a pro-inflammatory cytokine, it results in increased neutrophil recruitment. So uh, it sucks neutrophils into the area where bradykinin is released. It's a chemoattractant. And so you get high concentrations of immune activity, and that immune activity basically signals further immune activity. So you sort of get this uh, tornado effect where you know it starts off and it just gets more and more intense in that localized area as there's more and more immune system recruitment. And, and another thing it does is it results in increased vascular permeability, as I mentioned, and that results in fluid leakage into, in particular, in the lungs. And as you get that, that uh, fluid buildup, the way that we exchange oxygen, of course, is we exchange that across a very thin membrane. And if you start to build up fluid uh, in that membrane, it, oxygen has to travel further and further through that membrane uh, and, th and through the fluid as well to actually be able to exchange itself uh, in get into our bodies and then we get CO2 out that same way. So that's sort of the mechanism behind that. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the real question is, is there a lot of evidence for this? And aside from some BAL samples, um, there's really not great evidence that bradykinin uh, and bradykinin storm is responsible for the symptoms observed in moderate to severe COVID-19. And I'm gonna make a huge caveat here, that's at this time. I think we're still learning about this. There is currently very good evidence that immune responses and uh, elevated levels of cytokines um, are clearly seen in patients with moderate to severe COVID-19. And when you look at autopsy reports of patients who have passed away from COVID-19, there's significant evidence of immune-mediated tissue damage in those patients, both in their lungs, in their heart, sometimes in their liver and kidneys. So it can be pretty widespread. So Dan, uh, to just be, get a point to the question before, it sounds like cytokines definitively, but bradykinin storm might be a factor to, as well. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So for, for now, the answer would be, it's false that there's strong evidence uh, that right. bradykinin is responsible for- Great, all yeah. right, that's great. Well, I tell you what, uh, we, we've got uh, you know such great knowledge here, and uh, I don't know about all of our listeners, but I'm certainly learning a lot of facts here, and I'm really appreciative again of all the references you're providing us, so that we can go and read up a little bit more on this topic as well. So thanks for that, Dan. Uh, let's get to our last assessment question, and then we're going to take audience questions. Uh, this is one that I actually just heard yesterday on the television news, cable news channel. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm really anxious to hear your response on this one. Uh, our audience, let's get your opinions. The available evidence clearly demonstrates that patients with blood type A are at higher risk of being infected with COVID-19. So all of you who have type A blood, uh, you're probably interested in the answer to this question. Is it true or false that the evidence tells us the patients with blood type A are at higher risk of being infected with COVID-19? Well, we got a lot of quick responses on this, a lot of confidence, I think, among our audience about the answer to the question. So let's close the poll and let's hear what Dan has to say about this. So this one is really interesting and uh, very late breaking. Uh, so the history of this is that early on, uh, there were a number of reports that suggested a pretty strong association between blood type A and being at increased risk of COVID-19 infection. Uh, and to back that up even more, a genome-wide analysis uh, performed, um, by, uh, performed on the cohort of patients from Spain and Italy, um, and these were patients who had severe COVID-19, they identified all genes that sort of uh, stood out as being unusually upregulated, downregulated, missing, mutated, et cetera, um, to try to figure out what specific causes there might be to uh, COVID-19. And so one of the things that popped up in that study was that the, uh, the gene locus that controls our blood type, the ABO gene locus, was a marker of uh, higher COVID-19 risk. And in particular, uh, patients who had the genotype for blood type A seemed to be at the highest risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 and actually having severe symptoms. So for the first, actually up until very recently, even I was under the impression that blood type A conferred a higher risk uh, of being infected with COVID-19. And then starting at about you know early, actually middle of July and late August, uh, we started to see some contradictory studies that came out that suggested that that may not actually be the case. And so the most recent two studies um, suggest that there is not a correlation uh, between blood type A and increased risk of infection. And I'll again point out that one of those has not yet been peer reviewed. So do take that last uh, reference there, that's reference number four, with a significant grain of salt because it's, it's in that MedRx IV site. Um, but the other one from Annals of Hematology was um, pretty well conducted. And so that was, it's pretty convincing evidence. So uh, the answer right now is that there's not clear evidence that having blood type A places you at higher risk of being infected with COVID-19. But definitely, I think, still more information needed uh, and because of the contradictory nature of what we've heard so far. 
you know, the bottom line here, uh, I think for our listeners is that all of us, regardless of blood type, need to be using normal precautions to prevent COVID-19, including wearing masks and social distancing uh, and uh, washing our hands frequently and uh, of course, keeping surfaces clean. But at this point, there's no reason uh, to, uh, for people who have certain blood types, including type A, to be more fearful or need to live in fear uh, of COVID-19, that the evidence is just not conclusive that there really is a link in uh, with the blood type. So, um, yeah. And I'll, okay. throw, I'll throw in just one, one last thing. What this really highlights is I also, I think the need, just given the evolving nature of the pandemic, what you think you know the answer to, you may not know the answer to. It's really important to keep up on the literature uh, and to check with sources who could keep you up to date on the literature if you don't have the time to do it yourself, like APHA, like other professional associations who can help you summarize all this because it is changing rapidly. And so uh, can't, can't stress that enough. We've seen a lot of flip-flops in our understanding of COVID-19. Yeah, the data continues to evolve. This is a pandemic we've never experienced before, so that's uh, really an important thing. Okay, well, we're gonna start taking your questions, folks. And our very first question, we're going to unmute the line of Marina Wu. Uh, Marina Wu, your line is being unmuted. We'd like for you to ask your question about reinfection. I think, uh, I think we'll go on. There has been at least one known reinfection case in the U.S., and I think that hit the medical literature just this last week. Um, is that reinfection due to mutation of the virus or due to inadequate memory B cells? Why, why, did, why, why did we have this one reinfection? And I'll just also mention to our listeners, there was a reinfection, one reinfection case or two maybe in Hong Kong, um, and there's been one in the Middle East. Um, reinfection is not something that the CDC currently uh, is terribly concerned about because we've not seen widespread reinfection, but we did have this one case. So what's your response to this, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that's a, a great question and one that continues to be front of mind as people recover from COVID-19 and are looking to know that they're protected. Um, for the most part, um, it seems that people who are exposed to COVID-19 develop uh, immunity against COVID-19. Uh, and I'm not familiar with the specifics of this case. Um, so I, it's, I don't know whether it's due to a, a viral mutation or whether it'd be inadequate immune response. Um, but given enough exposure, it's expected that some people who are at high risk of uh, developing a particularly poor immune response may still be susceptible after recovering because they did not develop a strong enough immune response. So you think of kind of your traditional people who are at risk, those would be people who are uh, immunosuppressed because of HIV AIDS, uh, people who are undergoing chemotherapy treatment, maybe people who are receiving immunomodulatory agents because of uh, severe autoimmune disorders, things of that nature, or people who have uh, genetic disorders that predispose them to uh, be unable to develop an appropriate immune response. And so it may be the case that the, that patient fell into one of those categories. So uh, I think probably further further information, further workup will be done to help explain what happened there. Um, and hopefully we'll all learn from that. Thank you for that response. I'm gonna call on uh, Jean uh, Dinwiddie. Jean Dinwiddie has a question about testing. Okay, we may be having some audio problems today, folks, and I apologize for that. Uh, she tells me she has no audio. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan, the question is a very broad one. What, uh, what of, which of the tests or test types is most accurate? And how accurate is the rapid test? That's the one that I think people are most interested in right now is the rapid test. Tell us about accuracy of testing. Absolutely. So uh, the accuracy of tests varies uh, from obviously from test to test. Um, and so a couple things to before I get into specifics on tests, and I'll, I'll tell you in advance, um, I have not followed exact tests to know which ones are more specific than others. Um, when I need that information, I generally will go look it up. And uh, the best inf source of information there, I'll go right to the FDA's website and look at their information uh, that they're using to approve these tests um, and or from the clinical literature for the products themselves. 
But what I'm looking for there is sensitivity and specificity. Those are the key things that we want to be looking at. And so um, those help you identify true positives versus false negatives. And so um, you're looking for the test that has both the highest sensitivity and specificity. And so um, that's probably going to be the number one thing to do. Is if you're considering a test and you're thinking about implementing a test in your pharmacy, check out the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Um, how accurate is the rapid test? Um, off the top of my head, I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, Mitch Rothholtz, I'm going to ask you to join. We got a question uh, that came in. Um, describe the possible routes of distribution for how a long-term care facility uh, will obtain COVID vaccine for its residents. Can a nursing uh, home order it directly via medical director? What do we know about how nursing homes, uh, long-term care facilities will receive uh, COVID vaccine when it becomes available? Thanks, Michael. So at this point in time, we're still waiting uh, final determination from uh, CDC and Operation Warp Speed in terms of how vaccine will be distributed for, for both patients and uh, workers within nursing homes. Um, there are routes that are, are at least being being talked about related to national um, corporations, national chain distribution to nursing homes, but there've been also been a lot of discussions about other mechanisms without disrupting the workflow within the nursing homes, um, consultant pharmacists, for example. Um, we know, do know that there is, a, at the national level, the opportunity arising for group purchasing organizations who, uh, who serve nursing homes to engage like a national chain is being considered. Um, so there are mechanisms that are be looking, being looked at, as well as the state, local um, health, state and local health departments are putting together their action plans that are due this week, and that hopefully next week more uh, granularity will be uh, issued by CDC um, and HHS uh, in this regards. Uh, that's a great question, and thank you for that response. I know we're all concerned about uh, the outbreaks that have happened in nursing homes and certainly a population we want to prevent those infections. Mitch, before you go too far, I've got another vaccine question that I'll let you and uh, uh, Dan respond to here. Um, uh, the question is uh, about uh, how do we uh, combat, let me get this question, how do we combat those against vaccines in the quest for disease education? In other words, there's a lot of myth out there. We want to build confidence in vaccination programs. Do you have some suggestions, uh, Mitch, about how we uh, help patients have confidence in our vaccine program? Uh, I'll start. I'm sure Dan will, will be able to, to give further insights. But as he said earlier, evidence-based science and medicine, reputable entities who are giving the information, going to the source of, of the literature, those are ways that we as, as healthcare practitioners can be confident in terms of information that is currently the best currently available information. As Dan said, don't rely on social media for your information, go to the next step and also um, APHA through our website are trying to give you what we know as best uh, resources of information. Dan, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think another thing another thing is to you know engage in a lot of those skills that we've all developed, which is um, active listening, motivational interviewing. As you encounter people who uh, have concerns, objections um, about uh, the vaccine, it's important to understand where they're coming from and uh, make sure that you have indicated to them that you understand their concerns and then provide your the information that you have to share with them as a professional and as an expert. And so I think it's both the combination of um, having a solid knowledge base and just making sure as well that you, you're actually demonstrating true care for the patients that are in front of you, um, that you make sure that they feel understood and heard. And that goes a long way towards combating those feelings as well. One more thing to add to, to that too, is we also want to be consistent in what we're telling the public. And so that's why it's so important to stay in tune with what your public health departments are saying. Yes, absolutely. Very important to watch this thing carefully. I'm sure the vaccine uh, issue is going to evolve over the next few weeks. One more question about vaccines real quickly. Do we know yet about contraindications for the COVID-19 vaccines or is it a little too early to tell? My sense is, is that 
until the FDA does an EUA, we're not going to yet know what the absolute contraindications to vaccines are. Is that a good assumption, Dan? Yeah, I would say so. Based on what I've seen in the literature so far, um, the only contraindication I can think of at the moment, um, and this is not having seen any of the, the data coming out of the phase three trials, is if you're allergic to some formulation of the vaccine itself. And that would be the only thing. Aside from that, it doesn't seem that there's any contraindication um, right now. And of course, another thing to keep in mind is there are specific populations that these vaccines are being studied in. So for example, uh, most of the vaccines are not being studied in pediatric populations or very limited pediatric populations. So that would be another limitation as well. Yes. I want to also be uh, be clear to our audience. I made a comment earlier about the CDC uh, and their recommendations. I talked about hand washing, wearing masks, and uh, social distancing. I do want to encourage our readers to pay attention to the CDC recommendations. Now, I realize that some may be frustrated from time to time that the CDC's recommendations change, but that actually is to be expected in a changing pandemic that we learn more information and gain more information as we move along the pandemic and get more data and get more information. So the CDC is, in APHA's opinion, the authoritative source for this information. We support CDC's efforts and we support the science behind CDC's efforts. So we do encourage you to always keep up with what the CDC's recommendations are relative to the prevention uh, of COVID-19 and to stay close to that information. And so we wanna, we wanna emphasize that. We have lots of questions that we're not going to be able to get to today. I thank everybody for participating. Uh, we want to be able to share some late breaking information with you. And for those of you who had questions that we did not get to today, we will do our best to try to respond to many of those questions in the Engage platform for APHA members. Dan, thanks for your excellent work and joining us today. Elisa Bernstein, please share with us the late breaking information from Washington as it relates to COVID-19 and pharmacist authorities. Great, thanks, Michael. It's been a very busy week since we last met at last week's webinar for those of you who are regulars. First, um, HHS has announced that the government has opened the window for applications under the Provider Relief Fund and it's for qualified providers to receive fund payments for healthcare related expenses for lost revenue due to COVID-19. So these distributions don't need to be repaid to the US government, assuming the providers comply with the terms and conditions. And we are aware that pharmacies have been successful in receiving funds under the program. The window for application closes soon, November 6th, and the website has a step-by-step -step guide to walk you through eligibility um, and the application process. So I highly encourage you to go to that website soon if you are interested. Um, CDC has provided um, a lot of information um, and updated information. And just recently they issued a video entitled, Tell Me More About Vaccines to help answer come ask questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. And the, the video has experts such as Tony Fauci and the commissioner Stephen Hahn and other senior uh, HHS officials. So it's a good, good video to watch. There's also some really good information on that website. And if you go to the next slide, one piece of information on this website is a page that CDC just updated with information specifically for healthcare professionals. It has general information that points to what's going on in development for vaccines, allocation, distribution, and importantly, vaccine planning. So it's worth browsing, but don't expect to get the answers to the questions here. As Mitch said, this is all still evolving, but it's CDC saying, we know you have questions and we recognize what you want to know, so stay tuned. So just take a look, but um, again, the answers aren't necessarily there. And the next slide, please. Moving to FDA, some new information that um, we actually, uh, APHA staff um, met with FDA several months ago about this issue. Um, back in November of 2019, 
FDA required revisions to the labeling for insulin pens, um, stating that healthcare professionals should dispense the pens from a single to a single patient in the original seal carton. And most of these have um, multiple pens inside. FDA's concern was an increased risk of dispensing errors and the patient using the wrong product if individual pens were dispensed outside the carton. And insulin pens are approved to be dispensed in these original sealed cartons. So in this notice that FDA just published a few days ago, FDA said that they understand that there are situations where healthcare professionals may choose to dispense individual pens outside the carton, not in accordance with the labeling. And they put some guidance in, in there to say, if you're going to do that, have some additional safety measures, such as putting on some tamper indicator tape, providing a copy of the instructions for use to the patient, or labeling the individual pens for individual patient use. Um, they also said that, that um, if, if this is a concern for healthcare professionals, particularly pharmacists, that we should be reaching out and driving change but by the manufacturers and telling the manufacturers as well that this is a need. So the next slide, please. As uh, for those of you who are familiar um, with the, this webinar, every week we, we put out a plea for you to contact your legislatures and tell them that that pharmacist provider status is needed and should be included in the upcoming legislative package for COVID. Uh, and, F and APHA has a website where you can easily send letters to your legislators. And so if you go to this website, fill in the information, hit send, and letters will be automatically generated or you can tailor make them for your legislators. And it's not too late. So if you haven't done this, please do this. And I think the next slide, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, uh, it's uh, really a lot of information. Lots of things are going on. And I just want to reemphasize uh, what Elisa said, and I reemphasize this every week. We do need you to reach out to your members of Congress, and I know that some of you are growing weary in doing so because uh, we've been asking you to do this now for about 28 weeks, and I know you're getting tired of hearing me make the request. Please do not grow weary in doing good. We need you to contact your members of Congress because while we have authorities to do certain things, we have no direct payment mechanism, and that's why we need Congress to act. We must get paid for what we're doing. So it's very important uh, 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 that we take advantage of that. Now, I know that this audience likes to get CE because you're here today to receive CE during our live broadcast, but you should know that APHA's COVID-19 resources page at pharmacist.com, click on the COVID-19 resources, we have several CPEs available asynchronously so that you can meet your state board CE requirements before the end of the year. So just check out the library. We've got some wonderful ones there. There's a little more on the hydroxychloroquine saga that we mentioned today, uh, but also lots of others. And we just encourage you to take a look at those. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, I know some of you are getting involved in pediatric immunizations, and you'll remember that the Department of Health and Human Services, when they issued their order authorizing pharmacists to prescribe and administer uh, pediatric vaccines, did say that if you have a regular licensure requirement that they would like for you to complete pediatric immunization uh, refreshers uh, and get that information on pediatric vaccines. APHA does have an option for you that's a brand new, just created uh, 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 webinar that you can actually meet this requirement and the link for that is provided on this slide. Next slide, please. So uh, I've talked about the Engage platform several times. I won't spend any more time on it here, but we do look forward to continuing our weekly conversations on the Engage platform. And thanks to all of you who do ask great questions and share great experiences from your platform, from your practices on this platform. Next slide. 
uh, we do want to let you know, and don't don't hang up after we uh, get finished with this slide, because I still have to cover your CE questions with you and give you your credit for this uh, continuing education. But next week, our weekly webinar on October 22nd is going to be a really, really great program. We're going to be joined by the uh, president of the National Pharmaceutical Association, Lakeisha Butler, as well as the president-elect of the American Pharmacists Association, Sandra Leal. And they're going to talk about uh, some suggestions and ideas to address patient concerns with vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccines in underserved populations uh, that experience health disparities. And so we all know that uh, based upon the data that we see uh, certain populations in our society that have been uh, significantly impacted by COVID-19 infection and um, uh, including African-American populations, Native American populations and Hispanic populations. And so Dr. Leal and Dr. Butler both have tremendous experience and will offer very practical tips on how you can have good conversations with your patient population uh, to talk with them about vaccines. It'll be a very practical session and I don't think anyone here is going to want to miss that practical conversation. So be sure to join us next week. Now let's get back to those uh, CE questions and let's just get your response here. True or false, NSAIDs are unsafe to use in the setting of COVID-19. Now you've heard the program, what do you think? True or false, NSAIDs are unsafe to use in the era of COVID-19. All right, let's uh, show the response on this one. I think most of you heard this pretty correctly. The answer is false, that uh, they're not unsafe to use in the setting of COVID-19. Next question. True or false, there is significant human experience with mRNA and adenovirus vaccine platforms used for some COVID-19 vaccines in phase three trials. True or false? All right, let's show the results. And I think this was a this was an area where I think all of us learned a lot. Uh, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, this uh, this one was flipped. Uh, we were at about 50-50 in the initial poll. 92% of you learned today that uh, that there is in fact uh, 12 to 15 years worth of experience in using these platforms. They're not brand new, uh, and so that's very important. I think for giving confidence uh, for us as providers and for our patients. Next slide. Our next uh, question, please. True or false, there is strong evidence to suggest that hydroxychloroquine is effective for COVID-19 prophylaxis. True or false? Uh, what is the evidence behind hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis or prevention of COVID-19? All right, let's show the results of this one. I appreciate everybody's quickness on their response. 99% of you uh, agree that there is not strong evidence. Uh, there has been some uh, uh, limited uh, data, which was not a part of randomized controlled trials. So we do not have a strong evidence to support its use. And the last question here, I think this is the last question coming up. There is strong evidence that, oh, there may be two questions. Yes, there's strong evidence that the mo moderate to severe symptoms of COVID-19 are from bradykinin storm instead of or versus cytokine release syndrome. Now, this was a technical topic and it was a little deep. Uh, Dan did a great job of parsing it out for us. And let's show your results here. And, um, and it's correct that it's false, that uh, there isn't strong evidence that we really actually have stronger evidence to show that cytokine release syndrome is involved uh, there is some data building about bradykinin storm and some evidence there, but cytokine release is our primary mechanism. And then our last question today, uh, question five is, available evidence clearly demonstrates that patients with type A blood are at higher risk of being infected with COVID-19. Uh, clear evidence demonstrates that people with type A blood are at higher risk of being infected with COVID-19. True or false? And we'll look at our results on this one. And uh, it looks like that uh, you got it right, uh, false. Uh, we don't yet have clear evidence about blood types and that should not certainly drive 
people's fears of COVID-19. Again, thank you for all that you do in your communities. We appreciate you. Good luck and God bless.